Uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Christian de Klobers. Um, he is a Belgian photographer, explorer, public speaker and author. Uh, his work covers the polar regions and uh, oceans, including some of the most remote islands on the planet. Uh, Christian believes in the power of image, showing what is at stage, stake, uh, as well as the consequences of human footprints by documenting, witnessing and capturing. We look very much forward to your presentation. The floor is yours, Christian. Your Royal Highness, Your Ex Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much also for this uh, very uh, meaningful um, conference. I'm uh, honored to be here today. <clears throat> so it's a bit of a long title, but what I do is I believe in the power of image. I think image is still quite underestimated. Politicians on one, side, on one side, they speak their language of policy papers, strategy papers, and so on. And then scientists come with very significant reports. What I try to do is bridging the gap in between with image, through image, going to the front line of climate change and really documenting what is at stake, documenting impact in a direct way or indirect way through image or documenting vulnerability and just the last beauty that uh, remains on the planet. So I have a short film to start with. I think I have to press again. Yeah. <clears throat> My name is Christian Klaus. I'm an ocean and polar photographer with a mission. Nature is who we are. Curiosity drives me to explore wild, remote places. In this vast silence, I feel at home, filled with passion and gratitude. I contemplate my place in the universe. I recharge. This is my way of life. Everything started when I entered the Svalbard Global Seed Vault, a bunker in the high Arctic drilled deep into the permafrost to preserve the global biodiversity of our food crops for future generations. The ever-increasing tension between man and nature immediately struck me. It became my life's goal to explore this relationship and tension, to document impact and to raise awareness. Even the least inhabited, most remote and pristine areas of our planet reveal the brutal result of our behavior. Our lives depend on the ocean and on polar regions. They are vulnerable, indicating change and human impact. This impact affects us all. Climate is changing, biodiversity is declining, sea levels are rising. Images are a powerful tool for storytelling. I document change for scientists, policy makers, game changers and future generations. With shared knowledge, we can each play a part in making a difference. We can take action. Our very existence depends on it. Because nature is who we are. of image. I'd like to start with this photo. It's titled Lost. During uh, many years in the north and south as well and on the world's oceans, I learned actually that uh, indigenous people, they, uh, they are differently connected to planet Earth. They see themselves as an equal part and a part of Earth and of nature system. And we forgot that connection. Um, so this is a project that I did white out. You see uh, human beings there. Um, and the project is really aiming to, uh, to understand this connection because I think we lost a lot of significant knowledge that can also help us uh, to future solutions. In between man and nature, there is conflict. So this is Svalbard, uh, about 79 degrees north in the valley out of Longyearbyen. In June 2014, 
So you see no ice, no snow anymore. And then you see a natural a, a, a seal in its natural inhabited envi environment, and you see that there is a reflection. The water is water now, the ice has molten, molten, and you see the reflection of the water, you see the glacier tongue that is retreating. Now this is an interesting photo. You see in the middle of the photo is a horizon. You see a little cabin, it's like a house, but nobody lives there. It's used by scientists for research on uh, um, longer uh, uh, you know, expeditions. And then you see on the background, you see this rock, and the rock has been carved. This is clearly, it used to be a glacier, but no ice. So the same happens at the foreground. You see a piece of plastic coming up. Uh, you see a pallet, a tube. All things become visible when the, when the ice uh, and snow disappears. Beautiful rhythm in the water, but the water should be ice. This is 81 north, so that is like 900 kilometers from the geographical North Pole. This is still in winter. You see the uh, history of mining, a bit of uh, industrial heritage, and then some glacial ice with uh, uh, obviously some uh, ice coring being done. In ice is a lot of uh, significant knowledge. So you are the scientists, most of you. But I understood that uh, we can really read a uh, compilation of atmosphere and so on. So science is um, uh, quintessential in finding solutions, of course. Now, as you saw in the movie, everything started for me when I entered the Global Seed Vault. And the irony is that a couple of years ago, already due to the melting permafrost, there was a leak inside. Luckily, no uh, seed varieties were contaminated or like uh, touched by water. But so this is the door to the most important room for our food security, biodiversity for future, future generations, your great grandchildren. Uh, fauna is, uh, fauna and flora um, is declining due to climate change. Now I took um, this photo with an extreme wide angle not only because the room is, okay, it's a, a deep room, but it's not that large. The complete, um, um, so I took it because you can already see that there are, there are cooling, um, um, artificial, there is all artificial cooling because minus 17 is what we need for the seeds. And 130 meter deep inside this permafrost already, it's only minus 10. So everything is getting warmer. The permafrost is thawing and uh, water is dripping in. The complete, uh, this is the most complete collection now of gene banks worldwide of food varieties and contains now uh, um, of 1.2 million varieties and the complete capacity is 4.5 million. You see uh, on the left the complete uh, seed varieties of what is grow growing on the Canadian um, soil. So in the beginning they saw it more as a um, a symbolic um, deposit, and then we soon understood that uh, it's uh, you know quintessential, essential to safeguard biodiversity for the future. And as you see, it also surpasses geo, uh, geopolitical tensions. You see the three wooden boxes of the People's Republic of Korea. This picture is titled "Into Eternity" because we still discover species, fauna and flora, also plant species daily on a daily basis, and we, uh, we don't know the, how much capacity we need, so we don't know if this third room, the three rooms in total, will be ever filled. Now, last year I was assigned to document, to make a database, a photo database, for the Green Islands, the Grenoye Oyen 2030. This is a roadmap in the Lofoten region. I was assigned by Lofoten Raude to document what is Lofoten about, but also how coastal communities are living in relation to the ocean, to water, to nature. So I joined for th uh, during three months on every level of society. I joined um, uh, fishermen. I understood that uh, there are only a few people left who can really, really uh, smell when the dry fish is ready. And as, um, as in during the introduction was also told, um, the climate is changing. The cot, the, 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 um, the skrei, the winter cot, is retreating north. So fishermen have to get out really deep into the ocean. This man, he used to smell when the fish is ready, and he told me the climate is changing. The winters are getting, um, um, you know, more wet. Summers are uh, wet as well, less, less snow. Um, the quality of the air, the, the human, humidity, everything is changing. So I took a photo 
such as these, uh, um, to, to show you how this is uh, taken on a Rust, the island of Rust. And I show by this photo how society is re really uh, reli re reliable on fish. You see the, the stockfish hanging on the racks, and then the houses are actually quite far, but I show them on the, on the racks. Um, stilt houses, people are really cl living on a very small piece of land near the sheer cliffs, and you see a, a, a threat of water, the water they, that they rely on. Then I also understood that uh, this is uh, on policy level, I understood that the length of the ship decides the amount of tax people have to pay, so they built the ships very deep, very wide, and not really aquadynamic. So this is uh, maybe uh, <laughs> something, a message that I want to bring towards uh, Oslo or something. <laughs> um, sorry for that. <laughs> Let me bring you to the other side of the planet, Antarctica. This is um, not only the first emperor sighting, um, which you never forget, but it shows you vulnerability, but it also shows a bit of a sad emotion. This is exactly what I want to bring with, through my footage, through my image. I want to evoke emotions, make people think as well. This is named the Penguin Party. Some Adeli penguins on a beautiful piece of ice. And then climate change comes up. And everything that is drifting north goes to warmer water, but also saltier water, and it's a process that speed ups. And the next crack is already there, visible. This is an Adeli penguin on sea ice, it's called La Solitude, loneliness. This is um, a direct way to show what is happening, because what I show you here is um, a piece of uh, glacial ice that has rotated 90 degrees, and before this rotation, I show you how water warms up really, really warm uh, and, and quick daily and cuts into the ice. Before it turned around 90 degrees, this is, uh, these were horizontal layers. Now I can take a photo of a penguin or I can take a fragment of a penguin to show you the beauty of this animal. It looks, looks like a Picasso. It's, look at the shapes and the colors. So I want to show beauty. People see, but they also have to look This is a fragment of the largest king penguin colony on South Georgia. I saw a similar colony on the French islands in Kerguelen and Crozen in the South Indian Ocean. I also made a book project that is a, a dedication to the ocean. I sailed all oceans, uh, one ocean, but all the corners. This is a photo I took on the, on the equator showing the bluest blue that you can capture in a natural way. I'm a documentary filmmaker or a photographer filmmaker. So I want to show really what I saw. This is the bluest color that I could capture ever. So this is the virtue of a lot of patience. This is one of the photos I, I uh, shared with a scientific database, also this one. Flying fish, flying squid. When I took this photo, I didn't even know it existed. <laughs> <laughs> and here I show you how gravity pulls after um, like eight to 12 meters well, flying, but it's actually really uh, the speed that makes it through the lift uh, uh, make the animal possible to, uh, to traverse uh, this distance. And then it's, uh, it becomes heavy, it's falling down. And I showed how with its tail, it still gains a few meters. This is orca type D, quite rare, I understood. So marine biologists, they always get very exciting. So I took this at uh, uh, something like 55 south uh, in the, in the, on the French Antarctic islands the most remote island of the world, inhabited island of the world. It's not Pitcairn, this is Tristan da Cunha, and a population of 264 people. And I, I learned from them also this balance again in between man and nature. They live by the rhythm of the day. They have a complete different understanding of society and of their role in nature as well. So this is one stratovolcano, and actually likewise low photo, there is only a little bit of land to be populated. It's very, uh, well, sheer cliffs. And they have uh, two sources, potato patches at the right. You see this uh, little brown patch, that's where they crop potatoes. And then they have uh, an enormous amount of uh, lobsters. That's their only export product. So twice, three times a year, a supply ship comes. These people, they have lists, like, you know, we need, uh, I don't know, medication, pens, paper, whatever. And so uh, they're patiently waiting. And then the ships, they come in, they bring supplies, and they bring out the lobsters. This is a history of whaling of, uh, on South uh, Georgia. And I understood that uh, whalers, and this is a story that counts for almost every island on our planet, 
they brought in, um, uh, they introduced uh, the reindeer. Reindeer all the way from Finnmark, Lofoten, north of uh, Norway. And reindeer, they were eating the same as the pintail duck. And when an animal doesn't have natural resources, it might become a threat. So I understood that this duck survived because it adapted itself. It didn't extinct. It eats also carcass, uh, carcasses, dead seals. And they also have a problem, as every island does, with rats. Uh, normally it's the, the big four, I, I think you call it like that, the rats, the cats, the mice and the rabbits. Now the, the pipit, there are only about 500 left. This is a very rare photo of the South Georgia pipit. It nearly extinct because of rats and now they initiated a deratification program, but it's very hard to extinct uh, rats. I also understood that the same whalers brought back penguins. This is a story not a lot of people know. So during my project in Lofoten on the island of Rust, uh, I was being told, and there were some, uh, still some uh, tracks, some traces visible. In 1936, they brought penguins north and uh, tried to domesticate them. <laughs> it's quite interesting. And the story goes that uh, there were about 35, so half of them, they just you know, ran into the sea, never to be seen again. <laughs> and then the last one was, it's a bit uh, dramatic, beaten to death by an old lady that thought she saw the devil. Because people in those days, they didn't know what a penguin was. The story of rats, again, this is Ascension Island, and you see a rock uh, in the fo on the foreground, which is actually guano, hence the color, hence the, that's why it looks like gold. You see all these birds, these are is the Ascension Island fregat, and it is com entirely extinct on the island of Ascension. It only survives on this rock. Why? Because of the rat. These rats are so assertive that they don't eat only the chicks, they eat already, or, or not only the eggs, they eat already the chicks. The same is happening on islands like Gough Island, uh, near Tristan da Cunha, on so many islands. So this is uh, an interesting story. Now we also learn, uh, this is a research vessel from the French government, the Marion Dufresne, in the South Indian Ocean. So the ship always goes to anchor, on anchor. Um, so we learn from that, this is the way to uh, secure biosecurity. Kirgelen. Now I'm uh, still very occupied with a project in the Pacific. Actually, after this conference, I'm heading for Marshall Islands. This is a photo I took in uh, Kiribati, and I understood in the Pacific region that these people, they didn't really contribute anything to the footprint of what we call now and the effects of climate change effects, but they really have the largest impact. They live on atolls and small islands. Um, the only source they have is dead cor coral reefs, rocks to build a, a, a seawall. This is Tuvalu, the smallest, the fourth smallest island and also smallest island uh, of the world. And look when I turn the drone more down. This is the direct threat. They have uh, issues like coastal erosion and salinity of fresh water supplies to cope with. The only thing they can do against coastal erosion is planting mangroves, UN-based uh, programs. This is um, a very significant photo, I would say. The boy looking at his past and future at the same time. I really wonder what he was thinking. Because, of course, they have to import everything, which leaves a big foot step, uh, um, footprint as well. So this photo is titled, Thing Before You Buy. And it's especially uh, maybe a message towards uh, abolishment of uh, single-use uh, plastics and so on. Tuvalu. Now, Ru, that's a whole different presentation. <laughs> this is, a, a, in brief, a story of ecocide. Um, so on a very short term, uh, half a century, they. Uh, excavated all their natural resources and polluted their natural environment to that extent that it's uh, you can't do anything anymore there. So this is a, in brief a story of a family. Uh, they told me to go to uh, relatives on living on other atolls. Atolls a um, hundred year a uh, hundred years ago they were at low tide until their ankles in the water. Now it's almost a knee. Palau is a very positive story. The pledge, so they understood by protecting, they can, you know, play a much more significant effort. So I also document science. It's important to be part of research teams. So this is a zooplankton net, and we saw that 300 meter deep. You see all the little colors, the blue, the orange. This is all microplastics, and still the ones that we can see with the bare eye. So oceanography, basis of uh, understanding water and uh, anthropological uh, carbon footprint and all other variables are measured in these labs. 
This is an Argo float, Argo initiated by the United Nations as well, very significant. I love this program for the fact, for the, for the fact that uh, uh, worldwide people can access these data. So this is also crucial to share knowledge and data. And that's why I want to thank you all for being here today. So thank you. Thank you very much, Christian, for that uh, beautiful and thought-provoking uh, presentation.